the first annual um, St. Anselm Lectures here at St. Anselm Anglican Church. The first thing that my wife said to tell you so that you could tell your friends is that it's not St. Anselm. <laughs> it's St. Anselm. Like, it rhymes with helm, like helmet. St. Anselm. Yeah. So, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to invite our Senior Warden, Mrs. Carol Malizer, forward to give an introduction. Welcome to the St. Anselm Lectures. My name is Carol Milizer. I'm the Senior Warden of St. Anselm Anglican Church. On behalf of the Rector and Vestry, I welcome you to the 2022 St. Anselm Lecture Series, which we hope will become an annual seminar series. Tonight I have the pleasure of introducing our two lecturers. The first is the Reverend Sean S. Templeton, who just spoke to you. Father Sean is the founding vicar of Lakewood Anglican Mission and recently instituted rector of St. Anselm Anglican Church. He has served in Lakewood as a clergyman for 10 years. Prior to this, he served as assistant rector at Christ Church West Shore and St. Barnabas Anglican Church, as well as several mission congregations in Indiana. He was ordained to the priesthood in 2008 after completing his Master in Divinity from Ashland Theological Seminary. He began his formation at the Trinity Episcopal School for Ministry. Father Sean holds a bachelor's degree from Ashland University where he majored in history, political science, and philosophy. From 2001 to 2005, he was a scholar at the Ashbrook Center for Public Affairs. And in 2005, he received the Howard O. Rowe Award for the top thesis at the university for his work on Anglican theologian Richard Hooker. While at Ashland, he studied under Professor Louis Mancha. Father Sean lives in West Park with his wife Leah and their two children. Dr. Louis A. Mancha Jr. is an associate professor and current chair of the philosophy department at Ashland University. He specializes in medieval and early modern philosophy and philosophy of religion. He received his BA from Rice University and his MA and PhD from Purdue University. Dr. Mancha has delivered papers at several national and state conferences, including meetings of the American Catholic Philosophical Association, the Society of Christian Philosophers, the American Maritain Society, the Midwest Conference in Medieval Philosophy, and the Ohio Philosophical Association. Since the fall of 2003, he has taught a wide variety of different courses ranging from logic to ethics to specific seminars on Aristotle, St. Anselm, and St. Thomas Aquinas. Dr. Mancha also serves at his parish as an usher, lector, and catechist for high school and adult sacramental preparation. He lives in Ashland, Ohio with his wife and four children. We hope you enjoy the start of this series. Father Joshua, I neglected to print a timeline for myself. Could you bring me a copy forward? <laughs> Let us begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you've called us to serve you, that you've adopted us as your sons and daughters. And Lord, we thank you that you've brought us together here this night. We ask that you would illumine our minds with your celestial brightness. That we might see you and better understand who you are that our faith may grow in that understanding and that we might love you more because of it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
Amen. Well, I want to start out by saying that I am by no means any expert on Anselm. In fact, um, I've taken a few courses under Dr. Mancha, um, but uh, most of this lecture is coming out of several uh, sources, one of which is uh, a book called A Portrait in a Landscape by R.W. Southern, which is kind of the definitive 20th century biography of Anselm. Um, he is largely quoting a current biographer of Anselm, a man by the name of um, Edmer, I believe it's pronounced. And he was a monk and also a um, student of Anselm. So his recordings of Anselm's life are actually firsthand, which is incredibly helpful to us for, from someone who's so far away from us uh, in uh, history. So just looking at your handout there on the timeline of Anselm's life, we see that Anselm is a good ways from us. He was born in 1033, right? So let's see, that's almost a thousand years ago. What does he have to share with us today? Well, I want to start out just with a bit of philosophical waxing on Anselm. To some degree, every person is a product of his world. The times, prevailing beliefs, mores, ethos, and all of that surrounds us from the day that we're born, coming through our families, our schools, our churches, our communities. As a priest, my experience has confirmed what I suspected as a philosophy student years ago, that there's really no such thing as tabula rasa. There's no blank slate in man's mind. Edmund Burke's assessment that societies have a greater impact on an individual seems to, to ring more true to me than John Locke's assessment in his letter concerning human understanding. That being said, great men and women have an ability to step away from their times and even change the prevailing thought of their times for good or for ill. There is in such people a divine potential. It's why historians consider conquerors such as Alexander the Great or Peter the Great to be great, quote-unquote, along with people such as Pope Gregory I as the Great. This potential for greatness can be applied either to good or to evil. As the great 20th century apologist C.S. Lewis wrote in his reflection on the Psalms, it is great men, potential saints, not little men, who become merciless fanatics. Those who are readiest to die for a cause may easily become those who are readiest to kill for it. For the supernatural entering a human soul opens to it new possibilities of both good and evil. From that point, the road branches one way to sanctity, love, and humility, the other to spiritual pride, self-righteousness, and persecuting zeal. And no way back to the mere humdrum virtues and vices of the unawakened soul. If the divine call does not make us better, it will make us much worse. Of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. Of all created beings, the wickedest, is one who originally stood in the immediate presence of God. There seems no way out of this. It gives a new application to our Lord's words about counting the cost, from Luke chapter 14. It's also true in history, however, that one's situation in the world, as it's oriented around him, can give a person potential for human greatness and magnify it. For instance, a potentially great man might die of starvation simply because he's born in tumultuous times of war and famine. A great woman might never be able to rise to her pinnacle due to a time's societal norms. For example, in recent history, Lady Margaret Thatcher had a wonderful career 
in the 1980s. But would she have had such a career as Prime Minister of Great Britain 30 years earlier? President Clinton will never hold the historical esteem that President Reagan has, simply because the Cold War was over by the time Clinton got into office. President Harry Truman holds infinitely more greatness than does President Calvin Coolidge because of their respective times, not necessarily a reflection on their personages. Anselm sits in a rare confluence of time, therefore, a man both of great potential living in a time that's stable enough and also massively being changed by other great men. Historian and biographer of Anselm, R.W. Southern, writes, It can scarcely be too strong emphasized that Anselm's life covered one of the most momentous periods of change in European history, comparable to the centuries of the Reformation or Industrial Revolution. Now that's a really a big statement to make. Think about that for a minute. The Reformation and the Revolution were huge times of change, right? And they're closer to us, so they're easier for us to kind of assess, particularly the Industrial Revolution. We might point to our own experience even in the computer revolution, right? In the late 20th century, early 21st century. This is the kind of time that Anselm also lived in. And a casual look at his timeline, I invite you to do so, shows you this. Look at the people that are on it. Gregory the Seventh the great reforming pope. William II, Duke of Burgundy, better known as William the Conqueror, right? William the Conqueror, William I of England. Henry III and Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperors, holding vast lands in modern-day Italy, Germany, and France. Lanfranc of Beck, then of Canterbury was no slouch either. The first Norman Archbishop of Canterbury in England and also commemorated both by the Anglican and Roman Catholic communions. These are just to name a few of the people involved in Anselm's time. Secondly, let's look at the events. Here's just a few. Anselm's, in Anselm's lifetime, a fairly new Holy Roman Empire which a beloved teacher once told me in high school was not holy, nor Roman, nor really an empire, <laughs> was established in 962 by Otto. There's this great Muslim attack by the Sicilian emirate in southern Italy. The Norman invasion of England happens, changing the trajectory of English, indeed British, history. And of course, the First Crusade is called at the beginning of this time, known as the High Middle Ages, starting around 1000. This time that Anselm exists in starts the High Middle Ages, which continues all the way classically to 1250 AD. So how about Anselm himself? Well, into this world, Anselm is born. Despite some conflicts, it was a much more stable world in which Anselm lived, relatively speaking at least. The Holy Roman Empire brought some peace and order, and the Anglo-French wars hadn't yet begun. And on the other hand, in England, where Anselm would serve in his later days, it was a wreck of a society with a civil war going on from 1135 to 1154, known as, quote-unquote, the Anarchy, followed by the Norman invasion, of course, that we've already cited. Anselm's family. Well, Anselm's family history is clouded by history. He's born and lived in Iosta. And I hope I pronounced that somewhat right. It's the last town before the Alps in modern-day Italy. So right up at the, the corner, the uh, top of the boot there, you know, the, the part that looks like a cuff. So right before the Alps. It's the last town in the Alps before you enter into Italy and the last time before you cross northward through the mountains. In Anselm's time, it actually wasn't part of Italy because Italy didn't exist quite yet, but it was part of the Holy Roman Empire under the rule of Conrad II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor 
and also the king of Italy, and also the king of Burgundy at the time. Again, when we speak of countries, it's all relative here because the kingdoms are ebbing and flowing at this time. And it seems that Anselm's mother, Ermenburga, was the wealthier of his parents, probably with roots going back to Roman nobility even. So Anselm's from a noble family, at the very least from a family that was noble prior to Anselm coming onto the scene, but a, a waning family, a waning family. Historian Southern notes that that's evidenced by the fact that Anselm's father, a man by the name of Gundolf, moves to Aosta and into Anselm's mother's palace. So Anselm is at this interesting part in his family history, too, where he's of some means, but probably won't inherit anything. Right? The family fortunes are drying up. His mother was a devout woman, who spoke to Anselm often of God on high. And as a boy, Anselm pictured God living up in the Alps, naturally, as a little boy would, because his mother said God is on high, and he looked up to the mountains. His father, Gundolf, seems to be a rough man. Some historians, historians claim that he's an abusive alcoholic, but that evidence seems scant. All agree that he was free with his money, and that, it, and that he basically increased the waning of the Anselm family fortune. He had one sister, that is Anselm did, Richeza, Richeza, and it's thought that Anselm's mother died due to complications in childbirth with the birth of his sister. Edmer, the historian that Anselm knew, records that Anselm had a vision of God when he was about seven years old. Anselm related this vision to, to his biographer in old age, some 50 to 60 years later. But he relates it crystally clear. In that vision that Anselm had when, had when he was seven, he ascends up from his home into the mountain. And as he's ascending into the mountain, he runs into women who are carelessly reaping the corn. He's indignant at them. How dare they be so haphazard when they're in God's country. Coming up into the court of God, he finds God and one steward eating. And the steward gives Anselm pure white bread, something of an oddity in his time. It must have been a vivid vision, because the next day he woke up and exclaimed that he'd been in heaven and fed on the bread of God. And he carried that vision with him the rest of his life as his call. Anselm's contemporary and secret biographer, again, Edmer, relates that later in the life of Anselm, sometime before, he sometimes spoke of his family and the mountains as a place of peace. Anselm, however, did not miss his hometown because of his father. And as soon as his mother died, Anselm leaves Aota forever, never to return, which is interesting because the path would have taken him through it in order to go back to Rome from England and from France. He leaves in 1056, and he seems to have no inheritance, but he still has some means. He travels around northern France with an, a servant, and he'd heard of such schools as Orléans, Tours, Angers, and Chartres. Again, hopefully I said that somewhat properly, but I'm no Frenchman. Finally, Anselm went to Notre Dame at Beck, and he told Edmer that he was, quote, torn between his desire for the intellectual eminence and religious dedication, torn between serving God in a scholastic way and in a devoted monastic way. In the meantime, Anselm stayed at Beck while he was struggling with this, and, was, and, and met a man by the name of Lafranc, who was of the same country and people as Anselm. So there was a natural affinity between the two men. And yet, the two men were really different. It seems that Lafranc was a very practical man. He was great in lots of different things. 
He was a good lawyer. He was a good scholar. He was a good teacher. And he was a good administrator and a builder. And I want to stop just for a minute here and talk about Lefranc's accomplishments because he's a man in his own right. For example, under Lefranc's leadership, the school at Beck became a school that was renowned all over Europe. He had the foresight to begin a new type of school that was neither wholly monastic or wholly secular, which was very different at the time. You usually had monasteries and you had secular schools. But he started to blend the two. And the aim of that was very savvy. It was to appeal to the nobility and to see if they would send their sons to come learn with the monks. And of course, with nobility comes money. Lanfranc thus brought money into Beck and funded it to become a great learning place in Europe. Beck became a place with a grand library. Lanfranc added to this library, and Anselm benefited from this incredibly. Again, a situation in history, in Anselm's world, that helped him with his greatness. Lanfranc also used the money from the nobles to build new buildings, and several times the monastic school was moved to grander and larger buildings. Lanfranc was also a teacher of liberal arts, of whom Anselm says, quote, he relit the light of arts in the West. Now that's saying something, right? He relit the light of arts in the West. So Lanfranc is this reforming figure who kind of greatly predates uh, what would go on later on in the Renaissance um, with the expansion of the liberal arts and the, um, the webbing together of, for example, the ancient pagan philosophers with some of the Christian uh, church fathers. Although at the same time, Lanfranc was a very conservative man. He was more of the previous generation, and Anselm was more of the following generation of thought. For Lanfranc was thoroughly an early medieval man. It's true he was, in, this, in, in, a, in a sense, a Renaissance man, and that he was good at many things, but he was not a man of genius. He was a man that was kind of good at many things, but master of none. Anselm, on the other hand, was the exact opposite. He was really laser-focused on certain things and exhibited great genius, but was very poor in practical things, like administration and politics, as we see later in his life. Nevertheless, Anselm was exactly who Lanfranc needed. Again, the historian R.W. Southern remarks, it must soon have been clear that he, that is Anselm, was capable of taking over much of Lanfranc's work of teaching the pupils and correcting manuscripts, and Lanfranc had for the first time a brilliant and devoted pupil. As for Anselm, he had for the first time in his life a center of purposeful activity. But around this time, his historian, Edmer, his biographer, tells us of a conversation that he had with Anselm about Anselm's calling to be a monk, because at this point, Anselm was still just a student, just a pupil, not yet a monk at Beck. Anselm tried to be a monk early in his life, actually much earlier, back in his hometown, but his father had prohibited it. And Anselm was still torn between an intellectual life and a monastic life. And that might seem odd to you. I mentioned this earlier in the lecture, but think about this for a minute. That might seem odd to, for us to think of today, but it wasn't odd at Anselm's time to be torn between the two of these things. You see, the monastic life was a harsh Benedictine rule of life that demanded constant prayer, which took away from one's studies. There's a reason that Anselm is called the father of scholasticism which was the fusion of these two things. Those two things being prayer and monasticism on one hand and study and writing on the other. It's true, there's certain exceptions to this rule, like Lanfranc, who himself started to bridge the gap between the two. And yet, still at this time, there was a great gap between secular teachers and monastics, 
Uh, not unlike where we are today, I should add. We uh, read, I don't know, perhaps you haven't read, but, but I've read books that talk about how the age of reason has separated out spirituality from uh, logic and rationality, right? And in fact, we even see this come to us in some debates, science versus religion or science versus, regi- uh, r- science versus religion. It gets uh, cast in different ways, but in a lot of ways, we're right back to <laughs> this separation between a... Um, a look at uh, thought and prayer. So the monastics generally, prior to Anselm, had been preservers. They'd been preservers. What does that mean? Well, they were copiers of manuscripts. They were keepers of knowledge. They had a very important task, and it actually comes out of the fall of the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire fell, all society kind of went to hell in a handbasket. All you had left was the church. And so people, to keep things like even, uh, things like the recipe for uh, concrete were lost. The Romans built many great things out of concrete, right? If you've ever been to Rome, you can go to the, um, what used to be the, is it the Parthenon, right? The Parthenon, and you can see this great dome of poured concrete, which was not, nothing equivalent could be accomplished again until centuries later, because that, formula had been lost, right? So the monastics, at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, started to collect the great works of humanity and preserve them, and they would copy, and they would, you know, take another copy, and their son, or their spiritual son would copy that next copy, and that's how these things got passed down to us. In a lot of ways, that's how we got the Bible. Without their good preservation, we would have lost the Bible and all of the commentaries and the writings of the church fathers. So they played a really important role. I don't want to belittle that. But that role was starting to change and be changed by Anselm at his time, where monasteries, instead of just being keepers of knowledge, started to be revolutionary in applying that knowledge that they'd kept for hundreds of years. And we see that in Lanfranc a little bit and in Anselm a whole lot. So Lanfranc was revolutionary in pushing some some of the envelope on this. For example, Lanfranc was doing some great things with textual analysis in his commentary. He was writing commentaries, right? That, That seems like something silly to us today, right? To write a commentary on the Bible, that doesn't seem like a big deal. But that was a big deal. He was not just preserving, he was actually commenting on himself, albeit using the church fathers, tying things together. In this, he was nothing compared to Anselm, because rather than just preserving, Anselm's aim was to use the preserved knowledge to make something new. Anchored in orthodoxy, to be sure, and he was challenged on that several times in his life, but intellectually inquisitive, and building on the thought that had been preserved rather than just preserving it for the next generation. This was actually a a point of contention between Anselm and Lanfranc in years to come, where they wrote and corresponded. Lanfranc thought Anselm was too liberal, and Anselm thought Lanfranc was too conservative in their application of Scripture. Um, Particularly, Lanfranc didn't like Anselm's monologion, because he thought it was too revolutionary and didn't have enough citations. Footnote things, people. Footnote things. So Anselm was truly at a crisis of heart at this point in his life. How was he to pursue these twin aims to both glorify God with his mind and in his prayer life? He entertained several ideas, one of which was to just become a hermit. (laughs) To say, what the heck with it, I'm going to go out in the wilderness and just fight the devil in my own personal battles, right? There were great hermits before his time, going back to like the second and third centuries. And this would give Anselm the peace that he sought. He also had this interesting idea of going back to his family's property and using what was left of the family fortune to start a hospital to help people that were poor in his town. Finally, Anselm, disgusted with himself, asked Lanfranc to decide for him. What should I do? Well, Franck didn't want to give him the answer, and so passed the buck on to Archbishop of Rouen, 
And the archbishop decided what Anselm should do with his life and told him that he needed to become a monk with another man named Gundolf, who became his closest friend. Anselm continued to work with Lanfranc on his commentaries during this time, now as a monk, and it's actually a work that planted some seeds in Anselm's thought, which I think is interesting, and, and, and you know, try to hold on to this for the future lectures, because this is going to come back in some of the things Dr. Monchitz says. For example, in Lanfranc's commentary on Romans, Paul's epistle, chapter 3, verse 4, he writes, well, let me read the passage to you first. So this is Romans, chapter 3, verse 4. But God is true, and every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mayest be justified in thy works, and mayest overcome when thou art judged. And Lafranc's commentary on that is this. If this is understood, the sentence is a proof that God is truth, for truth is justice expressed in words. Now, think about that for a minute. Because again, it's a different way for, to think, right? If you're not a student of philosophy. What's Lafranc saying? God is truth, for truth equals justice expressed in words. Why is this important? Well, this actually becomes part of Anselm's argument in his work, De Veritate, of truth that we'll be reading together later on. Another example of Anselm's innovation was more, the more explicit use of pre-Christian ancient texts. For example, Anselm's the first medieval to explicitly reference Aristotle in Cur Deus Homo, which is Latin for why God became man. The first one to reference Aristotle. That was controversial, because Aristotle, of course, was a pagan. Could pagans have truth? After Anselm took vows for seven years, he wrote nothing. And he was busy in prayer, fasting, and reading. I want to stop there for a minute and just ask for questions. I've gone through a lot of material already, but hopefully it's sparked some thoughts and maybe I can give some clarification. I'll try. Again, I'm not an expert on this. But are there any questions? Dr. Mancha, any commentary? Oh, sorry, David, you have a question? That's an interesting question. So, so the great schism between the East and the West uh, was uh, the great schism between um, the, the Greek church and what would become the Russian church and the Eastern the Oriental churches, they're called, meaning the Middle East, not like the actual Orient. Um, the great schism was between the East and the West, and essentially there's, there's a lot going on there. But it, there's a lot over how the church is ruled, whether the pope is a patriarch or whether he's preeminent over the patriarch. Um, it, it was a, a huge battle of uh, power um, in the church and how the church was properly governed. Um, gosh, there's a lot that could be said about it. Uh, but that's kind of a, a fast caricature of it. How did it affect Anselm? Uh, later on in Anselm's life, he was actually tapped by, I believe it's Urban II, Pope, uh, to write a defense of the Western idea of the phililoquy. Am I saying that right? Yeah, phililoquy, yes. Do you know what that is? That's the, the, the procession, the idea that um, uh, it's in the Nicene Creed that um, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the Son, right? Instead of just from the Father. Yes, and the Son. Uh, which is interesting, because, uh, because he's responding to that at a, the Council of Bari, actually, um, which is held between some Greek uh, 
bishops and a bunch of Western bishops. Um, I've never read his arguments on it. It's an interesting, it would be an interesting thing to read. But basically, it's hard to overstate the effect the distance had on the church back at this time. <laughs> I mean, Russia might as well have been Mars, right? The time of Anselm. Uh, so the Eastern Church went its own way, the Western Church went its own way, and fought over these things for many years, and still fight over these things, leaving us Anglicans kind of stuck in the middle, which is why in our prayer book, the Philoque is actually in brackets, if you look at it. Typical Anglican fashion, we said, we don't know who's right. We'll put both of them in. <laughs> but we're Westerners, so we'll say it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's important. There's all sorts of gradations in that argument <laughs> um, between the East and the West, too. And there's also historical arguments, too, which is interesting as to who added it, when it came in. Did it come from Spain? Did it come from Rome? People, somehow it came into the creed. <laughs> so, and we know it came in in the West, and the East took umbrage with it. Uh, there's also biblical arguments to be had both ways from John's Gospel, too. Um, yeah, it, it was one of those things that I'm sure it matters. I, I'm not dumb. I'm not smart enough to understand why it matters. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Billy. That's a good question. So when we talk about secular universities at this time, that's, they're still not secular in the sense that we use the word secular, right? Secular universities in, in the medieval era are universities that are just simply not monastic. In fact, you run across this in other, uh, other medieval literature, and it can be quite confusing. When someone says secular, they're not saying, like, not part of the church. They're just saying you can substitute not monastic for secular. Okay, um, so for example, uh, using medieval terminology, Father Joshua and I are secular priests, which right doesn't mean that, that seems like a, a contradiction in our in our usage of the word, right? But we're secular priests because we're not members of any order; we're just priests in the diocese. Okay, so that needs to be said first. Um, secondly. Uh, the divide between the two is probably more in style of teaching than content, is what I've picked up. Now, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm, I'm just giving you what I can discern. <laughs> but it seems like the monastic, and I'm going to talk about this next, the monastic, scholastic side of things anchored learning in prayer. So even though they weren't monastics, they would have been going to chapel. They would have been going to the daily offices being said, right? They would have been anchoring their studies in prayer as opposed to just going to class. But, and then, like I did, you know, going and drinking at BW3 across the parking lot, right? Which sadly is no longer there. Alas, time moves on. But that's the big difference. Does that make sense? I can't give you any more information on it. Maybe Dr. Mantra can. 
Do you have any insight, Dr. Ranja? The difference between secular, quote unquote, universities at the time, which really aren't quite universities yet, even, right? Isn't, isn't Paris the first university? But at the same time, you've got Tyler. Is his uh, or Nicholas? Is Dr. Mancha's mic on? Is that going through to those watching online? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Is it on now? There we go. And it's right. down here. Great. We don't want to miss what you, what you have to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say something. Oh, well, I was going to say, uh, later on in Anselm's life, he gets into this uh, contentious disagreement with Peter Abelard, right? Um, and they definitely have a different um, way of going about writing and even teaching. So I think it, it's much more nuanced than, you know, how we would view secular versus vowed. But, but I think there's probably still some difference there. I don't know. Uh, there, there, there is something crucial about La, what Lanfranc does because all the nobility flock, their sons flock to, to Beck, which is what makes it this great place of learning. And now there's other great schools at the time too, don't get me wrong, but somehow this is cutting edge. And should these be distinct? Right? I mean, we, we are at the cusp, again, of when that, uh, uh, when that debate started. And that makes again, sense. Like yeah. you said, the inoculations have worn off. Right? So right. We, we, we demonstrated that you know, there shouldn't be any kind of rift between the two. And the inoculations have worn off multiple times, right? you know, like all of our COVID vaccines. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's, we have to go back to the to beginning and uh, try to demonstrate this. Hmm, that's interesting. Good. Other questions, comments? Holly. No, I mean he's 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 definitely privileged. <laughs> I mean he he has he has choices that other people most people don't have uh, at the time. I mean he he's not. It's weird because he's not nobility, but I mean he is nobility, but he's not. The, he's basically nobility with no power and dwindling money, right? So he's got a little bit of a little bit to trade on, a little bit of options. But not a whole lot. Like he, he constantly is trying to make friends with the rich and powerful, to, to do it. He, 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 interestingly, while he's not a good politician, he does have some sense in that. Um, his correspondence with uh, Duke William, later King William, actually shows that. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole, it's hard, again, it's hard for us to relate because medieval feudal society is so different, so different from what we think of, right? Um, you know, you're, you're very much attached to the land, all of these issues of fealty and, you know, swearing obedience, which actually comes in later in Anselm's arguments about how, you know, we need to have obedience to God and things like that. And his, con and his you know, he's really torn later on in his life because, 
he's made vows to the church, but the king demands his fealty, and what's he to do? And you know, it, it puts him in this really hard place because he wants to be a good Christian, functioning in his medieval society. Um, but yeah, he's torn by that. Ultimately, he ends up siding with the church, rightfully. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, let's go on a little bit. So Anselm takes these vows, and for seven years he writes nothing after becoming, a, vow, uh, becoming a, a, a monk. Um, he's busy in prayer, of course. He devotes himself to fasting and reading and praying and meditating. And Anselm studied the Bible voraciously. He's, he's got access to some of the best books in Europe. And he is, you know, in addition to going to all the daily office part of monastic life, he's studying. He gives an account to Edmer, his biographer, again, about how his life consists of nothing but prayer, reflection, meditation, and studying as a monastic. And again, Southern, the modern um, biographer, writes, he became prior at Beck. He became prior at Beck. Uh, so, uh, so he quickly goes from just being a monk to being the second monk in line to the bishop, or to the abbot. Uh, and, and you know, if you're following kind of how church polity works, how church governance works, um, this is like uh, the equivalent in, in the quote-unquote secular world, right? In the diocesan world of the dean and the cathedral, right? So, uh, and the bishop in a cathedral. So the bishop's like the top dog, but the dean does all the work, right? Um, Sometimes it's like that with Father Joshua and I, you know. I, I get all the credit as the rector, but Father Joshua gets to do all the hard work. Right, Father? <laughs> so, um, so Anselm becomes the prior of the, of the monastery there at Beck, uh, which puts him in the thick of it, both administratively and in study. So you can understand why he's not writing. But I think that this time in Anselm's life is really crucial to, to his development because it's at this time that he develops a method. It's at this time that he starts to fuse together what we've just been talking about in that, in that question and answer session. The idea of scholasticism, the idea of melding together the academic with the monastic prayer. Um, and it's worthy to reflect that the father of of scholasticism here struggled with that, but then comes to actually embody the union of those two things. So I want to take a moment and just say that, you know, this is, we've already talked about it a little bit, but, it, but to say that it bears fleshing out that fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding in the English, is not just a statement of one's priority. What do I mean by that? I missed this when I was a philosopher. It was many years ago in college. That it, it's not just something that we can say, I have faith, now I can understand. It's actually much more. It's more than a statement. It's actually a method of study. And I think, unfortunately, this is lost in the university. And maybe Dr. Monta can speak to it I, um, in his uh, evaluation of it, too. Maybe I was just too stupid to see it back when I was studying Anselm. But faith-seeking understanding, I think I'll use these words properly, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Mancha, is an order of epistemology. It's an order of epistemology. It's an order of how you know what you know. Is that right? Fair enough? We'll talk about it. Okay, let's talk about it. So what Anselm is saying is that you have to have faith in order to have understanding. You have to have faith in order to have good understanding. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. Psalm 14, verse 1. Right? The fool can't have understanding because he's denied God. You must start with faith. And when we're talking about faith for Anselm, we're not talking about, well, I believe in Jesus and now I can go to university. Right? What we're talking about is, no, your intellect has to be rooted in your faith. The metaphysics have to come first. You have to understand 
who God is and who you are before you can move on to questions such as what is truth or what is goodness or what is justice. Otherwise, your view is going to be skewed. And it's interesting that I didn't learn this in university, but I've learned this subsequently in parish ministry. Because when, when I talk to people, and if their first premises are wrong because they, they don't have faith, it skews the rest of their argument. It denies them truth in the end. Right? So for Anselm, the adherence to the faith is not just an intellectual project. It's not believing in the sense that it's believing in precepts, but it's actually the formation of the faith that seeks understanding. So the man who, or woman who reads and fasts and has visions and hones his mind and heart does so so that he can better understand and seek God. You see, it's not merely a matter of intelligence, of sitting down and reading a text. It's a matter of the disposition of the heart, of who you actually are, of what, how your soul's formed. Southern says it this way, that Anselm was not a collector or ranger of material, but he simply absorbed the Bible in his thought and in his language and allowed his meditations to grow as a river gathers strength from the spr springs from which it flows. For Anselm, reading and study was not separated from one's spiritual being. It was part of it. And again, this is coming out of the monastic. It could not, in, in other words, you cannot properly evaluate a text without first going to prayer. Does that make sense? Faith-seeking understanding is a method, not a motto. It's a method, not a motto. One must fit his heart and soul first for the acceptance of the truth. And so in Anselm's view, you have to strip away all of these things in order to even behold the truth. So in order to truly see God in his truth and his goodness and his justice and his beauty, those, those transcendentals that are later brought, about, brought out in the medieval era, the soul must first seek virtue and have some virtue by faith, which is really interesting. It's an interesting argument because it means that the Holy Spirit has to be doing something in you for your brain to properly work and see truth. <laughs> you see? That's a different way of seeing faith, seeking understanding, than what we moderns would generally see, right? We would generally see that as faith and understanding being on opposite sides of the spectrum. Does that make sense? Questions? Again, we're fleshing this out because it's important for later. Yes? Oh, I see. I think it's different. Uh, um, maybe Dr. Monster can say more, because I'm not, again, sharp on my modern philosophy. I don't, I don't know if you are, <laughs> but you're more sharp than I am, certainly. So the question is, is Anselm's idea here like the sort of standpoint epistemology? Oh, I see. I see. No, it's not. It's not that. It's not. Yeah, it's not contextualism. No, uh, it deals more with the capacities, I think, of the mind 
at being tied to the capacities of the heart than experience or context. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to overemphasize, I think, just how post-enlightenment we all are in our understanding of this, and, and post-modern now. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to overemphasize just what presuppositions we come to the table with on this stuff. <laughs> Is that fair? <laughs> So yeah, all right, let's, let's see, let's continue on because it's eight o'clock here. So I think it's worthy to reflect uh, upon Anselm's method here, and we'll be digging more into that, but it's interesting to connect how he actually embodies his method in his study, uh, the seven years of silence it's called and by historians where, where he's, he's just absorbing scripture and absorbing St. Augustine's works and absorbing some of the other great works of history and the church fathers. Um, and that guides Anselm in how he charts his life, not just in how he argues or how he writes. Anselm is very much a man of black and white, of right and wrong. He's not the politician. And that gets him into trouble. What is what is either right and holy is right and holy, and what is not, is not. His mentor, Lanfranc, becomes Archbishop of Canterbury, and by contrast, when Lanfranc becomes Archbishop of Can Canterbury over the, after the um, Norman invasion and finds things a complete mess, he's able to restructure um, the English church with great effectiveness because he's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none, right? He's, he's a brilliant man in many different things, and he's able to um, establish a great library in Canterbury, reestablish a uh, religious order there, have several councils, and that's in contrast with Anselm, who right away goes to loggerheads with um, the king <laughs> and is exiled twice, right? Just prior to becoming archbishop, Anselm wrote on the incarnation of the word in 1092 to 1094. And that period is a controversial time in Anselm's life where he starts entering into controversy politically by his scholasticism. So he's accused of writing heresy on the Trinity by Peter Abelard and Rosalind at that point. And he writes on the incarnation of the word in defense of his doctrine on the Trinity, proving that, in fact, he's orthodox 
Anselm's first visit to England is in 1060, or 1079, and again he visits England in 1080, 1086, 1092. Finally, Lanfranc dies, the see is held open for a number of years, and he's made Archbishop of Canterbury in 1094. When Anselm goes to England, he's well received by the monks at Canterbury. Uh, Anselm is quickly drawn, however, into this political intrigue. Again, whereas Lanfranc was more adept, Anselm was out of his league. It's kind of the reason that professors usually do so poorly uh, in, ac in the, academ the academy politics, right? <laughs> it's hard, sometimes hard for professors, if they're not political poli-sci professors, to interact in the university because uh, that's just not what they're adept at. Generally, often, Anselm is too laser-focused, and it becomes a detriment. Um, G.R. Evans, the historian that I had you read, says that, quote, he's ill-equipped both by cast of mind and by experience to discuss issues of will, power, and necessity. That's on page 17. Um, and one issue that continually comes up is what's called the investiture crisis. And uh, I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty details of it, but you can't talk about Anselm without talking about the investiture crisis. So this is a battle that goes on between church and state for hundreds of years. It all begins with Pope Gregory VII and Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire in 1076. Uh, I overstated that. It doesn't go on for hundreds of years, but there's, there's reflections of it for hundreds of years. This particular investiture conflict ends in 1122 when Pope Calixtus II and Emperor Henry V of the Holy Roman Empire agree on a compromise of the Concordat at Worms. But the principles are this. Who has power, the church or the state? And actually this goes all the way down to the English Reformation and the rest of the Reformations and of course down to us today. It manifests itself in different ways. Right? And so the principle is how the locus of power is shifted around. But the name of the crisis, the investiture crisis particularly, deals with who makes the bishop the bishop. Right? right? Who chooses the Archbishop of Canterbury particularly here? Is it the king? Or is it the pope? Remember, this is long before Henry VIII, right? <laughs> is it the king? Is it the pope? And who gives him, particularly who invests him, quote-unquote, with his ring and his crozier? Okay? Now, there's all sorts of other things that go on with this because, of course, like, that's the symbolic thing, but, but there's more important reasons behind that politically, right? One of them is taxes, right? Like, who owns the monastic lands? Do monasteries have to pay taxes or do they have religious exemption? In this country, for example, right, the church in the United States today doesn't pay property taxes. Why is that? <laughs> Separation of church and state? No. Actually, the reverse. The state actually likes the church and values it enough to give it a break on its property taxes. It's, it's seen as good. It's a stabilizing force. Yeah. So it's interesting that there's echoes of this all the way down to the modern era. It, in Anselm's time, um, in Anselm's time, a lot of it had to do with fealty. Who swears allegiance to whom? And this is where Anselm gets himself into trouble. He's sworn allegiance to the Pope. The Pope is the one who is supposed to select the Archbishop of Canterbury and is supposed to invest him and send him the pallium, which is like a, it's a, like a stole, but it's something that archbishops and primates have, right? And it comes from the Pope. And the king wants to stick the, arch, the archbishop's ring on his hand, give him his crozier, and put his pallium on it. But what does that say? The king has all the power, right? The king has all the power. Um, now, it's not like the Pope would travel and put these things on you, but usually like, he would send them to you with a letter that's read out publicly, and you know, that's, 
Um, that's his claim. So, so everything in the investiture crisis stems from this conflict of power. And again, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. It's, it's principle too. Um, but it, it's hard to wrap our minds around this because as modern day people, we say, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's a huge deal right, in the medieval world. Okay? And Anselm won't budge. He will not receive the investiture from the king. He says, that's not right. I will not do it. And finally, King um, Rufus, no, this, is this Rufus? Yeah, no. King William II. So this is, or yeah, William, also known as William Rufus, or William the Red, um, actually won't budge on his position either. And so Anselm is worked around. The Archbishop of York gets involved because, of course, Britain has two, or England has two archbishops, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York. And the Archbishop of York sees an opportunity. Aha, I can be the guy that's the loyal servant of the king and, like, one-up the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so he gets involved. The Bishop of Durham gets involved. Finally, all the bishops turn against Anselm in England, and Anselm's given the boot. He's exiled for the first time. He remains Archbishop of Canterbury, but he leaves. And he goes to Rome. And that, at that point, is when he actually attends the Council of Barsi and talks about the Philoque that we talked about earlier, which is interesting. So God still uses him, which I think is, is heartening when we see life taking weird, twisted turns. Right? Um, Anselm returns to England, however, when he dies, and Henry I of England becomes king and bids him to return and says, hey, you still have to do homage to me, but we'll, we'll kind of forget some of this investiture crisis stuff. Anselm again refuses, goes to the Pope, argues his case. He then returns to Canterbury. Long story short, <laughs> Anselm ends up back in England in his aged years. <laughs> he's, he's so infirm that he's carried around as, on a litter as Archbishop of Canterbury, but he does get to die in his... Archiepiscopal see as Archbishop of Canterbury. And before he dies, he brings many reforms that were needed to the church in England. Um, reforms as to tax and courts and all sorts of things. Um, there's a big list of them. That's in 1102. Actually, interestingly, this is the council that forbids English priests to marry. So up until this point in England... Um, priests could marry. And at 1102, the Council of London, that's taken away, only to come back later on at the Reformation. As a pastor, all evidence points to Anselm as a very loving pastor. Again, a side of him that seems to be ignored by history because his genius and intellect is just so overpowering. I mean, Anselm is still taught today. He's still interacted with, you know, by modern philosophers, right? The ontological argument survives and uh, is powerful. Um, but Anselm, he is a loving pastor. There's story after story about him helping the poor. There's story after story about him taking young monks under his wing and helping them with their doubts and discipling them. Um, there's a wonderfully preserved story of Anselm and a young man um, named Basso who actually ends up appearing in Anselm's works, um, which Dr. Mancha can talk about more later. But Basso comes to Anselm in 1085 with doubts about his faith. He doesn't know what to believe. And Anselm takes Basso under his wing and helps him resolve those doubts. And then later in 1094, Basso is actually called to Canterbury from Beck to help Anselm write Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Man, to help him complete that. And Basso is the only pupil that Anselm actually names by name in his works and has present a core argument that Anselm takes and runs with. Uh, so Basso is this, 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 uh, this monk, this disciple who's kind of immortally preserved in Anselm's work um, but it's an interesting insight as to Anselm's pastoral goodness to preserve for us today. As we read on together, I think it's important to remember that there is history and there are 
people behind these arguments, right? I think it's too easy for us sometimes to read arguments and to read books and discount the fact that these are, really, these are real people's lives. These are people struggling with their faith. These are people having doubts. These are people, um, you know, helping one another see the Lord. And as we go on with faith seeking understanding, what better way to spend our Lent together, right? Lent is a time where we embrace the disciplines of almsgiving, fasting, study, right? What are we doing in embracing those things? From my sermon on Sunday, if you were here, what we're doing is we're trying to strip away those loves of this world that get in the way of our seeking God and being in better communion with Jesus Christ. What better way to do this, to, to supplement our disciplines by adding this study to it and to seeking God with all of our mind as well as our heart and our soul and our strength. Amen? All right, that's the end of my lecture. Dr. Vantra, do you want to get up and give us a little bit more background? Or I'll try. I, I want to get started here um, with some things. Yeah. What kind of time do we have? What, I don't it's 8 12, so uh, we're going to, what we say, 90 minutes. So 7 to 8 30, I think. So um, I, instead of repeating a lot of things, I mean, I think Father Sean, you know, did, did most of the work for the evening, and I appreciate him inviting me here to talk to you guys, and I think we're going to have some fun in the next couple of weeks talking about some of the curious things that I'm familiar with, some of the philosophical issues that um, Anselm brings to the table. Um, and there are some central concepts that we want to keep in mind as we read, right, so for those of you who are going to be reading through some of the, the, the excerpts that we've, we've carved out for you, um, just kind of keep some of these things in mind. Again, the motto, Faith Seeking Understanding. This motto was upheld during most of the scholastic period, you know, from the 1100s through the 1500s almost. And this is why, again, Anselm is considered, as Father Sean talked to us about, as the father of modern scholasticism. Um, just as for those of you who might know René Descartes, who is considered to be the father of modern philosophy there in the 1500s, Anselm is writing and acting during a time where there is a significant sort of pivotal change that's taking place. You know, if we had to define scholasticism, you know, we would talk about it as a body of doctrine in which philosophy goes hand in hand with religious dogma. That is, these two things are thought not to be separate, but that a conversation can be had between these two issues. And in our modern world today, this is a really polarizing position. I hope we all understand that. We've seen it. How can philosophy and religion go hand in hand? But again, it's a really important doctrine that gets developed during this time. It starts with St. Augustine, but Augustine has sort of different fish to fry, so to speak, right, other than on Fridays, yes? Uh, and he he gives this particular groundwork that Anselm himself takes up, particularly because Anselm is familiar both with the Platonic and the Aristotelian traditions, and he's trying to merge these two Greek thinking systems together. You know, if we think about this broadly, as I mentioned to you, for many people in our culture, you know, the relationship between faith and reason has ended in divorce. You know, whether in the news, you know, at work, in the classroom, at the dinner table, faith and reason are seen by many as just thoroughly incompatible, especially from a scientific point of view. You know, to make matters worse, many people we know are quite ignorant of the proper foundations of their religious beliefs, whether or not they themselves are personally religious. You know, matters concerning God and religion, we're told they're not to be discussed or debated, right? Definitely not at Thanksgiving, yes, not with Uncle Eddie and are typically thought to have no rational or intellectual foundation whatsoever. Well, I mean, where's the evidence? If you think carefully about it, how can you prove any of this? I mean, if you want to preserve your religious thinking, we're told, we have to isolate it from reason. Faith concerns matters of the heart, we're told, things that we deeply believe. 
Our faith in God is something that we hold on to tightly, or loosely for some, you know. But we dare not question it. We dare not subject it to logical, scientific, and rational analysis. But I hope we'll see in the next couple of weeks that in the beginning this was not so. For those who study the history of philosophy, they'll find that these early church fathers, philosophers, and theologians sought not only to promulgate the faith, right, to live what they believed, but also to rationally defend it. And again, St. Anselm was one of those central figures. Okay? And when we think of philosophy proper, let's sort of consider what's going on. You know, Typical understanding of what philosophy is about. It's not that we may know what men have thought. It's not about history. It's about what the truth of things is. And for many years prior to Anselm, this was the common understanding of what philosophy was about. And it's pretty uninspired. You know, philosophy in the Greek, right, philosophia, means love of wisdom. And if you're searching for something, the truth of things seems to be the most likely candidate. But Anselm, as we know, and many others of his era, had to reconcile their understanding of reality with a particularly curious event that they believed had occurred at the turn of the millennia. Call it the resurrection. You see, as a Christian, Anselm knew that he held certain beliefs to be true that no ancient Hellenistic philosophy could ever have defended, could ever have proven. Indeed, if Christianity is true, it shouldn't take much to convince someone that there are plenty of claims about reality that human reason cannot establish at all. That's why we talk about revelation, yes? So what's a philosopher who happens to be a Christian supposed to do? Can or ought the study of philosophy still be done with a Christian worldview? So you see where this divide can be grounded, yes? And if you ask some contemporary philosophers this question, you, can you do the study of philosophy as a Christian, you're going to get a wide variety of answers. You know, you get 10 philosophers in a room, you ask them a question, you get 15 different answers. But for the traditional philosopher, anyway, the solution is rather simple. Reason must be the handmaid of revelation. Unaided, we know reason can lead us down the wide garden path. You know, for if Martin Luther was right about anything, and, you know, he asked me on certain days, I'm not quite sure how much he was right about, but if he was right about anything, it's that reason is a whore and will obey any master who can pay her price. But for those of you familiar with your scriptures, you may also remember that the first person to the empty tomb fit this description. And if God could transform Mary Magdalene by the power of his grace, so too, by analogy, reason can be employed by revelation to lead others to the truth about reality. And you know, what is that truth? Well, it's the understanding of reality, the being of all things, the source of truth itself. And as we read in the Gospels, for this reason, divine wisdom, clothed in flesh, declares that he came into the world to make known this truth. Quote, for this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. So to return to the earlier question, what's a rational Christian supposed to do? You know, well, if things are as we used to think that they were, then we might not have to seek to justify our faith so that we can try to make sense of reality. Rather, you might be able to contend that faith itself is a prior and necessary condition for understanding the nature of reality, as I mentioned earlier, just as reason is and perception is. It's a power we have, and very few of us, maybe I'm not talking to anyone here, yes, but you know some, yeah, hone this power, yeah, and that tells us something very different about the concept of faith that we're accustomed to in contemporary society, but it tells us something very significant about what Anselm is attempting to draw out in his writings. You know, between us and the Greeks, you know, in 2000, you know, between the time of the Greeks and us in 2022, you've got Christian revelation. It intervenes. And St. Anselm takes this to be a very curious circumstance. It modifies the conditions under which we have to think. It modifies the conditions under which reason has to work. When you're in possession of this, or even exposed to this kind of truth, how do you ignore it? Even for those of us who study philosophy, and of course a lot of philosophers out there are atheists, you know, even under those circumstances, they have to explain away, you know, what roughly three or four billion people on the planet hold on to. So it has to be 
approached. Do you understand? It has to be wrestled with. You can't just kind of ignore it and say, well, they're all idiots, yes? Or they're all irrational, yeah? Because that just won't work. Or they're all nuts, right? <laughs> so we want to recognize exactly what Anselm is kind of dealing with under these circumstances. I mean, initially, St. Anselm's writings were not developed for theological study or for scholars, you know, as were the writings of other med medieval figures like St. Augustine or Peter Lombard, okay? Um, and then for those who lived after him, like St. Thomas Aquinas a hundred years later. Nor is St. Anselm usually cited as a figure of authority by these figures, although he's mentioned every now and then, particularly by Aquinas. But for those who examine the history of philosophy, you know, we can understand that Anselm is providing for us an incredibly systematic way of thinking. He's influenced the doctrines of the church, as well as the philosophy of religion, as Father Sean mentioned. And as we've already heard, his philosophical approach, his method was incredibly unique at the time. Augustine, of course, was an incredibly literary figure. If you read Augustine's Latin, it's, it's very difficult to translate, right? You need to, have a, you need to be a master of the language to truly get the nuances, right? Because Augustine was trained in rhetoric, and he just had you know, a beautiful way of expressing himself, okay? Anselm wasn't worried so much about the literary tactics here. He focused explicitly on drawing certain philosophical conclusions from certain dogmas, from certain religious truths. Anselm weaves together philosophical principles with scripture. And again, he's attempting to try to bring together, as we'll see you know, over the course of the weeks, this platonic understanding of reality versus this Aristotelian understanding of reality. His familiarity with Aristotle's categories uh, was absolutely pivotal in getting him to think about, well, when you answer certain kinds of questions, uh, how about a basic one? What exists? I mean, if I were to ask you to think about this for a moment, what would you say? And if you could give me some kind of conditions for determining how something exists, that you can distinguish it from other things that don't exist. What kind of conditions would you give me? Would you say, as some of my students say, well, it has to be tangible, Dr. Manchu. You have to be able to sense it. You've got to touch it, taste it, feel it. You know, like babies, right? They stick everything in their mouths, right? Because they're on, right? Well, maybe. That might get a lot of the things that we think exist. But again, what would your conditions be? Start thinking about them. You ought to worry a little bit. Anselm was what we call a metaphysical realist after the fashion of Plato, right? He calls himself a, a, a self-professed Augustinian, and St. Augustine was a metaphysical realist after the Platonic style. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but the primary way of thinking about it is, you, what do you think is real? Again, if you had to define what distinguishes reality from fantasy or illusion, what would be your conditions? Like I said, there's lots of objects in the world. We can see tons of them with our senses here. We can go up and touch them, right, and get data. But what about other kinds of things? Things that you do think exist, by the way, but you know they're different when you think carefully about them like colors and shapes and weight. I mean, think of the colors of the seats or the color of the uh, carpet here, right? You think red is real, don't you? Who doesn't think red is real? Huh? A blind. A blind person, they don't have access to it, yeah? But when you think about the nature of what's real, right, particularly red, I mean, who would question that, yes? I'm serious. But here's what you also know. You can't go to Lowe's and buy a bucket of red. Yeah? You can't go to, you know, Home Hardware in Ashland and buy, you know, three bushels of, you know, rectangularity. Yeah? But you can buy a red piece of cloth, yes? And you can buy... A red, what? A red brick. A red brick. 
Notice, you think red exists, but you don't think it exists like you think the pew exists. You don't find it by itself on its own, do you? But that's really strange. It's really strange when you, when you think, like, what are my conditions for something existing? Because it can't be. It's got to exist completely on its own, independently of other things, because then you'd have, to, you'd have to give up on red and weight and size and all the things, actually, that we quantify over in our sciences, ladies and gentlemen. Well, if you have a problem with that, I mean, what about ideas? Presumably, you need to take in information from your senses so that you can have ideas about them. Ideas seem to have a kind of reality for us. Ideas influence us. They have some hold over us, notice. In fact, there's no way to actually consider the things that you think are real without considering them first as an idea. You can't get outside of your head. Have you realized this? Have you figured this one out yet? You cannot get outside of your head. Everything that you have, every access to quote-unquote reality, is from your first-person perspective. It's all just an idea. That's all you've got, really. But we hope, we pray, that the ideas connect us up with something that we think is external to us. We hope this. Do we have any rational reasons for believing that ideas are real, then? In fact, are there any things that exist which are not physical or tangible? And what is their role in making sense of the rest of reality? These are little things, yes? Your belief in the existence of red. And how you think about it makes or breaks everything else that you decide to judge about the way that the world is. This is what he's taking from the categories, by the way, right? Aristotle's categories breaks up. They're the, they're the categories of being, right? We talk about substances, the primary things that we have access to, and then there are the other categories by which we come to describe those things. But those seem to be real too, yeah? We can't throw them away without doing damage perfectly to our understanding of everything. And if God's real, how do we categorize God? In our minds, in our hearts, and our ability to be able to access that. And this leads to the role of language, of course, right, quickly. Again, most of us think language is separate from reality. I mean, just like we can think of things that don't exist, like unicorns, dragons, Harry Potter. Yeah. We also use language to say all kinds of things that don't, seem, they, they don't have any bearing on reality, we think. We think we can use words in very strange ways, yes? We can say weird things like, there are red things, that aren't colored. The Loch Ness Monster exists. Father Sean is an amphibian. Look at the four orange penguins in the corner. Yeah? All of which are false, by the way. I don't, I don't think you're an amphibian, Father Sean. But how do we know? No, just seriously, how do you know? Those are simple things. We haven't even talked about the hard stuff yet, yes? How do you know that? What is it about language that allows us to convey ideas that somehow hook up with reality? Do you think language is just an arbitrary thing, just a way of making noises? If you do, we wouldn't be able to use it to speak the truth. We wouldn't be able to use it to actually get at anything. So Anselm thinks that the noises that you make draw to mind certain kinds of ideas that you have, and the question is where do you get them from? And do those ideas hook up with reality? Because you want a definition of truth? Here's one. It's a very simple definition. It's one that the medievals like to talk about. Truth is what we call the adequation of thought and thing. Right? Wouldn't it have been nice if Jesus had just said that to Pilate, yeah? Right? He's like, what is truth? Well, you, look, it's the adequation of thought and thing, man. You know, what are we here for? But, you know, he didn't do that. It's the hookup between what's going on in here and what's going on out there and the real worry that we should have, that Anselm has, not just with ordinary things, but with how we connect with the divine, is how do we get that hook up? It's got to happen some way, yes? Otherwise, God's a figment of our imagination. 
Otherwise, the rest of reality isn't worth paying attention to. Right? And he thinks that God is real. What an amazing concept, by the way, that God is real. And that if God is real, we can say true things about God. And we can know about God. And if we think that all of that is separated out, well, well woe to you, O scribes and Pharisees. Yes? Woe to you. We need to be able to be ready to give reason for the hope within. So he thinks there's got to be a way of being able to talk about those things that we believe deeply about. Assuming that they're real, yes? Assuming that they're real. And we have to believe that they're real, right? If, if Christ be not raised and our faith is in vain. Right? You, you can say, Paul presses, it, it doesn't matter whether your faith makes you feel good, right? Makes you feel like, you know, you're part of something and makes you feel like you're doing good things out there in the world, right? If Christ be not raised, your faith is in, you're wasting your time. So we, we better find a way of being able to talk coherently about this and get at that fundamental nature of reality that we all really believe in. Yeah? We don't think we're just going through the motions. I hope we don't. And if you do, we can talk afterwards, yes? So we can go in a bunch of other directions, but I think we're at our time now. Um, but these are just some sort of highlights as to some of the things that you're going to start seeing as you look through these texts and how Anselm is going to try to wrestle with them, wrestle with issues concerning our faith, as well as, you know, can we give arguments? Can we have what we call rational justification for believing any of this? And then can we sort out some of the other details as well? Right? Can we talk about good and evil, justice and injustice? Right? Can we talk about, you know, uh, the atonement? Why did God become man? Why did God even bother, right? Because he didn't have to, according to Anselm. Yeah, he could have just left us. So, I mean, with that, I don't know how you want to conclude, Father. If you want to sort of conclude in prayer, I think well, it's a good time to stop. Um, to remind people of the assignment for next week. Um, do, we, do you have that in front of you? I don't have these. Oh, yeah. Everybody else probably does. <laughs> Take a look at your reading list there. Out. Oh, it's like you planned it. Truth. <laughs> so, um, are we reading De Veritate? I think so. I it just says on truth here. Is that, that is of truth, right? Yeah. So, De Veritate. Yeah, and then I gave some sections in the Monologion to sort of get at that particular issue as well. So, in his dialogue on truth, He'll talk to us not only about the nature of language, right? So we use language primarily to communicate, but also how we can find truth in things. Clearly, when we say it's true that there's a piano there, there's also a fact of the matter, yeah? And so it's true, yes? The piano is truly there. And is that different from just the noises I just made? Yeah. Why does that matter? Well, because when we say God is truth, yes? Right? And this is what he starts with. What does it mean to say God is truth? Well, we need a whole dialogue for that. Yeah? <laughs> and then that's where it goes. What we mean when we say God is truth. So if you haven't already, get yourself a copy of Anselm's basic writings. Um, if you're going to read along with us, it's uh, pretty reasonable. I think it's $15 um, paperback and has all the readings that we'll be doing in Anselm. If you, don't need, if you don't have the time to read, don't worry about it. You'll still get a lot out of these lectures. I think, as you see, Dr. Monch is very adept at explaining these arguments. So um, I want to thank you, Dr. Mancha, for coming up for five sessions. It's very generous of you. And we'll see how the last one goes. I might not be able to be <laughs> at least four. the last session. But, uh, yeah, definitely. And I want to thank you for having me, for inviting me here to talk with you. I hope we can have some fun and maybe have some time in between to like ask questions, right, to kind of really to get out some of these things. All right. Well, let's pray then. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of all truth, that in you we move and live and have our being. 
We ask, Lord, that we would have that we would go forth from this place um, with a new joy in who you are and the gift that you've given to us and in people such as Saint Anselm. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless us as we go forth from this place. And now may the peace of God, which passed with all understanding, guard your hearts and minds, the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ. And may you go forth blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.